The Vice President Dr. Mohamedou Baumia has commissioned two zipline medical drone services distribution centers at Enum in the eastern region and Ketakrachi in the OT region. The operationalization of the two centers is part of an objective by Zipline to achieve nationwide coverage to enhance the delivery of medical consumables to all corners of the country. Speaking at the joint commissioning ceremony in Nyangbo Soya in the Afajato uh, South District of the Volta region, Dr. Baumia emphasized government's aim to expand healthcare delivery, especially in rural areas. The commissioning of the two distribution centers brings the number to six centers situated at vantage points across the country. The centers are seven over 2,300 health facilities. The newly commissioned Enum and Katakrachi distribution centers would aid the timely delivery of medical consumables to health facilities in the Volta, Oti, and Eastern regions. The Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, underscored the contributions of Zipline to the fight against COVID-19 and general health care delivery in the country, especially rural areas. When the world was hit by the dreaded COVID-19 pandemic and all countries were challenged by the difficulties of even distribution of vaccines, the Zipline drones came in handy. My understanding is that close to 1 million COVID-19 vaccines have so far been delivered by Zipline to many health facilities across the country. This, no doubt, is one of the contributing factors for which reason we have not experience massive expiries of the vaccines as happened in many other countries. By this also, Ghana, through the operation of Zipline, has become the only country in the entire world, the only country in the world to use drones to deliver COVID-19 vaccines to those centers with the hope of ensuring that all citizens get the opportunity to be vaccinated. He also detailed that Zipline has helped to efficiently manage medical consumables. From Orinaco to Impaya, Vopsi to Sofiyosu, and now Enum to Ketekrachi, Zipline drones have been almost everywhere flying over hills and valleys to bring health care closer to the people. Beyond the immediate benefits of drone delivery of vaccines and essential medical products to recipients, it is the improvement in the management and distribution of medical supplies from the various central storage facilities that is also important. The issues of wastage, unaccounted medications, poor disbursement records, expiry of medications have reduced substantially and we now have a robust structure that in Ghana that can be appraised and monitored. The whole delivery process in the context of the zip line in the supply chain is very much digitized. The general manager of zip line, Nana Adoko Yosen, hinted that her outfit is aiming at extending its services to homes. Since 2019, we have delivered 1.7 million medical commodities, including blood, essential medicines, and vaccines to over 2,300 health facilities across 147 districts in 13 regions. Your Excellency, it is interesting to note that since we started our operations from these two centers in December, we have already delivered close to 200,000 units of critical medical products from Enum and Ketekrachi sites. This expanded business cooperation supported by the government of Ghana, the Ministry of Health, 
and our allied partners has witnessed comprehensive and rapid development in the health sector. Aside from the home commendation of reducing the incidence of infant mortality through vaccine distribution program and the swept to medical emergencies in remote areas, we have also been recognized internationally with the accolade of being the world's first and only national drone delivery service. Well, over in the Ashanti region, the Regional Coordinating Council has taken steps to address logistical issues hampering sanitation-related operations. Many attempts to clean up the region, particularly its capital, Kumasi, have largely failed. Regional Minister Simon Osei-Mensa says the city's sanitation problem will be solved as a result of current efforts to secure logistics. Nanay Aljima has more in this report. Over the years, Various administrations of the Ashanti region have made efforts to deal with sanitation menace in the city of Kumasi. Last year, the Sustainable Cleaning, Greening and Beautification program was launched for the restoration of Kumasi to its Garden City accolade. Carton of filth cleared off the streets was a challenge during the pilot implementation phase. Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osaimensa explains as you might be aware, has three components. That are the cleaning. Uh, most often, what we've witnessed in this country, that after cleaning, we leave the debris that we collect along the various drains. And when it rains, it's taken back into the drain so that no work is done. Under a partnership with Waste Management Group, Zoom Lion, 13 waste compactors have been secured for the project. Fueling and maintenance, as well as staff to man the vehicles, will be provided by Zoom Lion. Joseph Siao Ejapon is Chief Executive Officer of Zoom Lion. We want to use this thing as support. We also want to commit that we are going to provide its fueling, um, the driver's support salaries, and then other logistics. Other logistics. We are uh, coming out with tricycles, containerized tricycles, which possibly within a few weeks we'll also organize that one and then come and hand over uh, to you so that the work that you are doing uh, in the Ashanti region will be able to enhance. The Ashanti Regional Coordinating Council hopes the logistics received will boost efforts to deal with poor sanitation in the region. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima Kumasi. Well, let's go over now to the Ejusu municipality where some assembly members there are involving the local assembly in internal wrangling of the new patriotic party will obstruct development in the area. Now, this comes after some NPP elected uh, polling station executives uh, engaged in a protest march demanded the removal of the district chief executive. But some assembly members want the party members to act with caution. There is more in the following report. The polling station executives embarked on a street march to demand the removal of the Joso MCE, Samuel Odro Frempong. The group is unhappy with alleged comments by MCE claiming the polling station election was skewed to favor some persons. Kwapna Mwating spoke for the group. We are giving him a week. If he is unable to point us to the irregularities, if he is unable to meet the burden of proof in respect of his allegations that he has made, we are calling on the president to remove him. But a group of assembly members in the area say the demand of the party members is unwarranted. A government appointee to the assembly, Kweku Intim Chumesi, explains. For us, we don't want to interfere in the party's issues. But as an assembly, we cannot sit on consent and allow things go the way it is going. Because as, as, I said, as I said earlier, it will destabilize the assembly and the development that we so deserve might not, we, we may not be able to achieve our developmental goals for the year or in, and even beyond. And that's what we want to fight against or stand against. That is why we are solidly behind the MCE and we want him to stay focused and give us all the developmental projects that have been earmarked and approved by this assembly. Meanwhile, Mr. Chumesi says the MCE must be allowed to serve his tenure after showing much promise in his first year. Mr. President, we as the members of the Municipal Assembly are interested in the work of the Municipal Chief Executive assigned 
to him by the constitution and the assembly bylaws. We will urge you and the sector minister to only assess him by the works assigned to him and not what a group of people want him to do based on their own parochial interest. Well, now, residents of Bompa, a farming community in the Atibubu Amanting municipality of the Bono East region, want government to provide them with potable water. The residents have for a long time been drinking from dirty, brownish, stagnant water due to the absence of potable uh, water sources. They also trek several miles to neighboring communities for water during the Harmerton seasons. And schools, go, uh, school going children sometimes stay out of school as they join their parents in search of water. Correspondent Anna Sabed has more in this uh, report to commemorate World Water Day. Contributors to avoidable deaths and diseases in most rural communities across the world. This lack of clean, portable water has over the years increased vulnerability to conditions including diarrhea, malnutrition, and malaria amongst residents of Bompa, a predominantly farming community here in the Atibuba Mountain Municipality of the Bonaise region. This dirty, brownish, stagnant water here is the only source of drinking water for the people here and their animals. This is the only water source serving the people of this community. Just take a look at our population. Children come around and bath in this water and it is the same water source we all drink from. Water has been our major challenge here. In our population, we go through a lot during the Hamatan season and we sometimes spend the entire day here without eating just because of water. These residents sometimes have to spend the night at the water source in order to get water for domestic purposes. Some of us live here from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next day before getting water. Moru Akwasi is an opinion leader here. He says the situation is even worse during the Hamatan seasons as residents trek several miles to neighboring communities in search of water. Don't have a portable water source. The only water we drink is a stagnant rain water. So in dry season, we travel about four miles to, pro to get water to drink. This unfortunate situation affects both adults and children of this community, with school-going children unable to attend classes during Hamatan seasons due to the scarcity of water. Children in this community join us in search of water during Hamatan, and as a result, they do not go to school at all. Assemblyman for Fokwesi Bompa Electoral Area, Techi Kwabna laments how the situation is also affecting the health of the people living in this community. In fact, Bompa people they are facing water problem a lot, a lot, a lot, especially during the dry season. They travel four miles away before they can get water to drink. Even that water is not pure for human consumption. So. If they, they did not come to our aid, it will affect our health. So many diseases like skin rashes and all kind of diseases, which we acquired from stagnant water. As we mark the World Water Day today, a day that seeks to celebrate water as well as raise awareness of the over 2 billion people living without access to safe water, the people here have a common plea to authorities. We want the authorities and we are appealing to the government to come and contract portable water so that we can access to portable water. 
Our only plea is that we need water because without water, we all cannot live. So for the people here in Bompa, uh, a community under the Atibu Amanti municipality of the Bono East region, this has been their only source of drinking water. They do almost everything, including household chores, with this uh, source of water. Their call is simple. They are calling authorities to provide them with a portable source of drinking water. My name is Anna Sabit reporting for Joy News. Note, let's all conserve water. We have a limited supply on the planet. That's how we draw the curtains on the AM news. But up next, we hit the newspapers with our news review. Liz Hay from Asante joins us. Do stay. Thank you for staying with us. Time now for us to dig into the papers, and we're joined by media consultant Les Hayfan Asari, who is our guest. Les, a very good morning to you. So refreshing seeing your face again. <laughs> good morning, and thanks for having me. Right, right, right. It's been a pleasure. Over the last week or so, I mean, it's, it's been just about a week, and people talk a lot about the fact that you purchase something uh, today, next minute, it has increased the next day, two days after that. I'm on this group page where yesterday someone was bemoaning purchasing something for about 7,000, is it 6,900 or so CDs? And the next time he went, a few days later, it was 7,500 CDs. So some of these fluctuations. Uh, what has been your experience with these as you have cooked, as you have gone around, as you have done the day-to-day -day <laughs> matters in this past week? Have you, have you experienced the same in any way? Oh, yes, several times. Um, you go into a shop and pick up an item and you think that you need more of it and you go back and the price has changed. And like you're saying, it's overnight. And yesterday I was dealing with somebody who had to give me some money and the person said that, I said to the person that he would give me the CD equivalent at the prevailing rate. And then he says, the rate is changing every day. We have to fix the rate. And I said, wow. the rate is... I said, the rate is fixed. You give me the equivalent at the time you're giving me the money. You change it at the time you're giving me the money. So the rate is fixed. I'm not the one fixing the rate. And I was saying to him that, unfortunately, I do not agree with the dollarization of our economy. So I wouldn't take the dollars. He should give me the CD equivalent. Wow. It, it means, basically, this person is struggling to meet the CD equivalent. Let's, let's assume they took... $300 from you and now and at the time it was say six point something or or whatever and now they, they, they you're looking at over eight CDs uh, just about so you see the difference per dollar and and that is where the problem is this is also where the problem is for students for example who are here studying especially on the back of COVID and you have to pay fees or pay for this or that in American dollars the American greenback it's 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 quite a plight but that brings me to what the daily yes, graphic... but unfortunately for him right no go ahead go ahead go... i was i said unfortunately for him if i take it in dollars by the time i'm paying it into my account if i was to go to change it into cds it would have been devalued right right hmm anyway so tied to that in the daily graphic newspaper bank of ghana tackles challenges. Uh, it has raised the lending rate and it has withdrawn three COVID-19 stimulus measures. So let's take a look at the story. The Bank of Ghana has raised the rate at which it lends to commercial banks to the highest level in five years. It's gone up by 2.5 percentage points. Now the bank increased the policy rate by 250 uh, basis points actually or 2.5 percent from 15.5 to 17 percent. The highest since 2018. Now, the central bank has also withdrawn three stimulus measures that were used to cushion banks against the COVID-19 pandemic as part of a raft of policies to support the economy, to fight the rising prices of goods and services, and arrest the rate at which the CD loses its value against other major international currencies. At a press conference yesterday, uh, Bank of Ghana Governor Dr. Ernest Addison 
expressed confidence that plans by government to raise $2 billion from the consortium of local banks would help improve the country's reserves and slow down the pace at which the CD was losing its value. There's more on this story on uh, page three. But to you, Liz, uh, so uh, a, a different cocktail of matters to address. First of all, I've heard from the likes of Dr. Cassia Lato Forsen, uh, who is on the Finance Committee of Parliament, saying that, or, or was it Okujetu Ablako, one of them, saying that these measures, yes, but they are too little, too late. Other proactive leaders, according to them, from Rwanda to other parts of the world, responded much earlier, even last year. Now where we find ourselves, it is a bit late. And, and though this is going to have some impact, I think it was Dr. Dr. Atavorsen, though it is going to have some impact, the impact is going to be minimal because we've waited far too long. What's, what's your quick take on that? I think that I tend to agree. Mm. Um, in December, or even before December, we saw signs of going into economic crisis, the, uh, the CD devaluing. We saw um, basically things going haywire. So I'm asking myself, um, did Bank of Ghana have to wait this long? Um, could the mitigation have been earlier? Would it have cost us less? Um, would it have, have kind of mitigated the suffering of the people, especially those who are below the poverty line, who are now struggling and don't even know where their next meal is coming from? I also agree that I think that it's a little too late. Um, well, it probably would help, but to what extent? Could we have done it quicker? Could we have done it faster? If we could have, why didn't we? What was the Bank of Ghana waiting for? And those are the questions to ask. What was the Bank of Ghana waiting for? Maybe it had to do with uh, the recent uh, meeting in uh, Pidwiasi. You know, uh, members of the economic management team together with cabinet met there. And on the back of that, they came up with some suggestions that we've been told about that will be rolled out, including the reopening of our land borders, because that in itself has created its own uh, economic stifling or stifling of our economy. So all of these measures, in fact, people have been calling for the reopening of borders on the back of falling COVID-19 numbers and all of that for a long time. So I guess we, we have our backs asking. against the wall now. So did we have to wait till we had our back against the wall? That's the question. I think that sometimes the institutions that play in, in the economic space need to be proactive. Mm. Do they have to wait for executive to crack the whip before they jump? Right. I mean, sometimes they, know, they see what is happening. They know what is happening. They know the best policy to, policies to put in place to um, cushion us as a people. Why aren't they proactive? Why do they have to wait for somebody to make a call? That, that, is, that is the big question. And just to wrap on that, uh, you, would also, you would always expect the political jabs uh, when it comes to uh, this. So you would recall that uh, the current vice president back then was talking about the fact that they had arrested the CD, uh, the, the falling CD, and uh, he had given the key to the IGP. And in, in a recent retort, former President Mahama, you can expect this from both sides coming and going. I'm waiting for Dr. Baumier's uh, you know, uh, latest response. Hopefully something will come up. But the former president is saying, no, the, the vice president currently has rather been arrested by the dollar and uh, he can't be found talking about these issues. But it, it goes to point to how serious this matter is, staying away from the politics, how serious this matter is, because we're feeling the pinch. Ordinary Ghanaians are feeling the pinch in our pockets, and we want it resolved speedily. But let's move on to some other matters. It also, it also, shows, it also shows how our economy is not independent. We do not have an independent economy. Our mm. economy is always riding on the dollar. What are we going to do to make sure that the city has value and can stand on its own, such that any other currency would be compared to the CD on the CD basis and not on that currency's basis. Well, good point you make there. The economists will also tell you that, I mean, the dollar is more like the gold standard across the world. Even China, uh, the likes of Russia. Russia has enough rubles to pay its uh, international debts, but people want 
it in the American greenback. I mean, all of these things tell you that, yes, even the, the other juggernauts in the economic space still have to fall on the dollar. But I, I, I agree with you when it comes to the fact that we can do more because a more stable currency will still peg fairly against uh, the dollar. And, and we can all breathe easy when we are transacting. Uh, President tells ECOWAS court to reform procedures. Uh, that is on page 16 of the paper. There's also EU supports TVET with 17 million uh, euros and GCGL AMCHAM to promote Ghana-US ties. On the international front, very briefly, unknown gunmen attack two police stations in Nigeria. Then there, there is ECOWAS Mali reach no agreement on transition. And... Um, West African mediator for Mali, uh, good luck Jan Jonathan, left Bamako yesterday without reaching an agreement with the Malian junta on the duration, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, of the transition and a date for elections, his delegation and Malian authorities had said. L let me just come back to you, Liz. Uh, how troubling do you find it that our sub-region has been bedeviled by these... Uh, coup d'etats, and still in, in Mali, in, in Burkina Faso, and in Guinea, we still have military leadership. ECOWAS has still not been able to find its way around these dictatorial uh, leaders, these military incursions. W what, what are you looking at? What are you expecting in, in terms of that trajectory? For me, it is very worrying. I thought that we were going to move away from coups and coup d'etats and stick to peace and development. Mm. But we realized that when a government takes over, or when there's a government in place, um, the people's um, concerns are not really addressed. So it's easy to get a group of people to come together to agitate against what the government is doing. And if it continues for a while, then you probably would have the military step in because people are always complaining and people are always calling for a change and people are always um, raising concerns about what the government is doing. Especially when people begin to live, and I'm talking about people in government, those who have joined the executive, right. begin to live at an extent where those who they have lived with see that they have improved in leaps and bounds in their standard of living. And yet you who are working hard and, and, and probably hewing the wood and drawing the water mm. can't even seem to get your head above the water. You can't even seem to get one meal on your table a day. And definitely when people start agitating, even though we do not want coups in the, in the sub-region, you get the military stepping in because they think that um, they should stand in for the people. Um, if it probably was a people's revolution, you probably even would understand it better um, than the military taking over, because I believe that when a military takes over the administration of a country, it sends the country back. But then um, what are we doing as a sub-region to ensure that every country is able to stand up and, and mitigate or fight Coup d'etats, what are we doing? Because the people, when the coup d'etat happens, seem to rejoice. And, and in rejoicing, they are more or less giving their support to the military who has staged the coup. And, and then it becomes more difficult, especially if the, 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 the coup plotters get to realize that, well, the people are rejoicing, they're standing behind us, they're supporting us. So they definitely want the government out. So we need to, as a people, and I'm talking about the sub-region, ECOWAS especially, we need to be able to draw the lines for good governance. We, are, we should be able to ensure development and development across board, not right. a group of people feeling better <clears throat> than, than another group. Right. Uh, I keep saying that when I pray, I pray for those who are below the poverty line, because if I am struggling, I can imagine what they are going through. And I, and I totally agree with you. These are disastrous times for people who are eking out a living, people who are getting minimum wage or even less. It is, 
It is heart-wrenching because you see people, and, and a lot of them are reaching out to people like you, I'm sure, and people like me every day. The Momo yes. and the rest, we have to be sending every day because these are people that you see. Your economic situation may not be the best, but you look at someone else's situation and you realize you, you, must, you must help. You must simply yes. help. And, mm. and, and to think that it even gets worse because, well, I can sit and say that my children have finished university. But right. I have people around me who come to me for hostel fees, who come even for chop boxes. I mean, they can't even send their children to school because they do not have the wherewithal to just even provide a chop box. Right. And if you if you look at some of the basic things that they need, um, it's difficult for them to, I mean, act and live in. And therefore, anybody who comes to Kind of, kind of say that, look, I've come to redeem you from all these hardships and all this poverty, they definitely will jump on board and follow. But mm. is it the right way to go? It is not. Because afterwards, when you get a government, when you reinstate democracy, you right. realize how many years you've gone back and how you have to start and come forward all over again. Mm. So ECOWAS should be up and doing. We As it was, right. They, they shouldn't just go and be sitting at meetings and making big and, and laudable promises. They should make sure that the, the policies that they are, they are coming out with are implemented. And if they are implemented well, then the sub-region should be booming by now. Here's a story that I I'd, I'd, I'd really want to run by you. And just this morning, as I listened to the BBC en route, um, I, 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 I was listening with rapt attention because of the nature of its context. Uh, impunity drives sexual violence in South Sudan. That's according to uh, the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights. And in a 48-page report, I'll just quote something from them. They have t spoken about how rape has been carried out during attacks on villages, and they have been systematic and widespread. And... Uh, Widespread sexual violence against women and girls in areas of conflict has been fueled by systemic impunity, according to that report. Uh, it's heartbreaking because in that specific community or that country, uh, people also don't often report these things because it comes with a lot of stigma, not just for you, but for your family. And especially in the religious context in, in which they find themselves, it's pretty difficult. So it happens to you and you can't even talk about it. But I want to link that to child brides in our own country in the 21st century. It is still happening. We have a hotline documentary that touches on that. How troubling is it that even right now, children somewhere in the country may be in the process of being given away in marriage when in fact they, they shouldn't be, when they are still children? It boils down to our economic situation once mm. again. Right. So families can't make ends meet. They have a daughter. There's this rich man who, or seemingly rich man who probably is 30, 40 years older than their daughter, but they, their, their situation can be mit mitigated if they give their daughter in marriage. And I keep saying that child brides, the children themselves do not go and get married. It's the families. Um, so we need to educate our families. We need to show them the importance of making sure that the girls grow up and grow up properly. And some education has started, but is it enough? If the family thinks that they are in dire straits and this is the only way they can get money, then they definitely would go that route. It is not the best route. We say that um, there are sanctions against those who would give up child rights, but are we able to crack the whip? Mm. Have we cracked the whip so far? I don't know. I know a few people have been reported to the police. I know they've been taken to the police station. I don't. I think that a few of them have gone to court and the girls have been released. The girls have been able to go back to school. But still, the family is in dire straits. So then what do you want the family to do? So as a nation, it should concern all of us. Mm. I cry for child brides because when they, once they get married, everything stops for them. They are not sent to school. They are made to stay at home. They're supposed to start having children. Their bodies are not developed. They are maltreated. All kinds of things. And 
that's not what we want to see our young girls go through. If we do not groom our girls such that they can take over um, the side of the, of the equation and balance our, our, our development, then we are, we, are, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. So mm. there's a lot that we need to do as a nation. There's a lot that we need to do to ensure that the girls are protected. Right. Talking about um, the UN and the rape and, uh, of, of girls and women, I have been in Sierra Leone after their conflict. I've been in Liberia. I have seen it. I have seen girls who have gotten pregnant and don't even want to see their children when the children are born. Right. Because they don't even know who the fathers are. You know, and so it breeds a lot of hate. It, it breeds a lot of dis, dis, uh, displeasure. The girls go into depression. They are not willing to touch anything or do anything. They see a man and they are so repulsed by just seeing a man. So what are we doing as a people? The UN just coming out and saying so does not make it better. And then they... Does not make it better. What are we doing to ensure that the soldiers are well behaved? They behave properly when they see the girls and the women. Right. What has happened to our compassion? What has happened to our hearts that we can't see people and treat them like human beings and we always want to kind of like degrade them? Mm. Good questions. And, and all of us are involved in, in ensuring that the right things are done. Though, those in authority, those in the media, and people like you as well. And I, I'm happy that you've spoken forcefully on this matter. I had a recent interview with Dr. Obed Asamoa, former one-time foreign affairs minister, in fact, the longest serving, and uh, attorney general as well. Uh, interestingly, on page 12 of the Ghanaian Times newspaper, snippets of the interaction I had are uh, here. And he talks about a number of things. And I, I just want to put to you, in any democracy, you want to look at a viable, sturdy, robust opposition to keep the government in power on its toes. I want to ask you how viable the NDC is at this point in time, looking at some of what they've been saying. And it's on the back of what Dr. Asamoa says. He has called on government to be accountable and transparent with Ghanaians, but touching on former President John Mahama's running mate in election 2020, that is uh, Professor Nana Jino Pukwajiman, he says she was unable to make an impact in the central region, uh, pointing out that she lost a seat in her home region. It has been corrected that she actually, I mean, KEA was won by Samuel Mills, the, uh, the, uh, the brother of former President uh, Mills. But they lost in the region. And he says it could pose danger for the party in the 2024 general election should the MPP select Alan Tremartin because he also has um, parentage in the central uh, region. I ask this in a twofold way. Has the NBC so far proven itself to you to be a viable opposition, a government in waiting? And secondly, what do you think about what he says about another woman, from Sanana Jane Opokwajiman? Would you like to see another woman on the ticket uh, come 2024? Very difficult questions. You're putting me on the spot. And I think that um, looking back at what happened, uh, I do not look at, at results of politics except for parliament based on, on regions or constituencies. Um, for, for presidential, I don't look at it that way. I look at the whole of Ghana and to see what impact has been made over the whole of Ghana, not the central region alone. For central region, it has always been a swing region. You, you cannot tell which way they will vote. It <laughs> depends on, on the way they see the, their circumstances that they're, they're in. And, and that will cause them to, to cast a vote for or against you. Mm. Um, do I see the NDC as a viable opposition? Um, yes and no. Yes, because I believe that the right now in parliament, because it is a hung parliament, you realize that a lot more consensus has to be done. Um, 
No, because I think that when we are talking about issues, we should veer away after elections from, politiz from politicization. We are too polarized as a people. Let us talk to the issues and talk to the issues objectively, not biased because of the color that we are standing, standing in. Um, so I believe, and I have always said, that mm. if the government is doing well, say so. So there are areas where the government is doing well, say so. Right. There are areas that the government is not doing well, draw the attention to it and make sure that you keep them to what they have said they will do. Right. And that you should make sure that they end up executing what they have said they will do. Because if you come and take over and you haven't kept them to their work, and they have varied from what they were supposed to do. You are put in that situation where even when you come and mend it, people would still not see it exactly. because there's still a lot you have to do. Exactly, exactly. And that is what I want to see in our governance. I want to see our governance at a point where after elections, let's put, uh, let's put aside all the bickering and the backbiting and the breaking and, of mm. each other. Mm. And let's stand as a people to develop the country. The country belongs to all of us, whether you're in position or you're in government. Right. And so you should make sure that it develops and it develops properly. Let's let's take a quick uh, swipe at this. Uh, I've been told of a vehicle that recently was, I mean, a chain of vehicles whose parts were taken off. You know, as some of these very common vehicles that are around, the Hyundais and the Kias and the rest, uh, the, the side mirrors, so it appears out of hardship, and, and there's no justification for stealing, but some of these people are going around taking the caps of the, the mirrors and the mirrors themselves, taking them, detaching uh, parts of cars that are detachable, and they, they are selling them, you know, out on the market. Well, I'm linking that to the story on, in, in the middle spread of the Ghanaian Times newspaper, Thieves Burgle NTC Accra Offices. I'm talking about New Times Corporation. Eight offices burgled. I mean, it would take some courage. It appears people are becoming more and more uh, brazen with some of these. And, and it boils down to definitely uh, the hard times. I, I, I don't know what you make of it. But very quickly on that. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to think of which offices were burgled. If I, have, if I, if I knew which offices in times were burgled, then... I'd know whether it was really thieves or if it were if it was from insiders who burgled those offices. Mm. Because if it's just a, th a thief on the outside, the number of doors when you enter New Times Corporation, you won't know where to go to take one. So, so, so here, here are the offices. Two people have been arrested anyway, but uh, they are reported to have broken into uh, the office of the managing director the editor and deputy editor of the Ghanaian Times, the Ghanaian Times and the Spectator Newsrooms, Human Resource and Information Communications uh, Technology, and made away with a Lenovo laptop, an unspecified amount of cash, and a Huawei mobile phone. Why I say so is that I worked in Times for several years. And, and that, that is exactly why I, I brought it up. <laughs> and, if you, and if you do not know the offices, um, I, before, they didn't used to be labels on the doors, but if there are labels on the doors, still, you have to go around looking for which door has which um, officer in it to be able to beggle it. And, and so, um, it's difficult to say if people have been arrested, let's see if they're from outside or if they are insiders. Let's see if... Um, Let's see if they probably were, there's a kind of a syndicate that involves people from work, who work with Times. Mm. Again, my question is that what happened to the security at New Times Corporation? Where's the security at New Times Corporation? Right. I've always said that there should be security on the inside just as on the outside at the gate. Because right. anybody can walk through the cemetery, jump over the wall, and they're in New Times Corporation. Yeah. And, 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 and those are... Th those are valid concerns, especially coming from you, someone who has worked with them. I'm just wrapping with these headlines. Uh, the entertainment page of the Daily Guide uh, newspaper. Ghana didn't use Shakta Beyonce collab for gain. That's according to Kojo Entry.
as a maestro, and that Joe Metal doesn't deserve Artist of the Year nomination. That's according to Ras Kuku, who has been asking uh, on Daybreak Hits what exactly uh, Joe Metal has done within the past year to merit a nomination. I'll wrap with the Daily Statesman, where it says government will protect flagship programs. That's according to the information uh, minister. You know, in recent times, there was talk about free SHS, uh, uh, planting for food and jobs, among other policy initiatives being reviewed. And what are the 16? We know, we know maybe two or three. What are, what are the other 13? Mm. Um, and, and do we as a people have a voice? Um, what have they listened to us? Which are the areas that we want? Probably agriculture, yes. Free SHS, well, I have had my, my take on free SHS for several years. I think that it should have been done slowly because if my, if my child goes to an international school and wants to go to Wesley Girls, I should be able to pay fees for Wesley Girls because I've been paying higher fees in the, in the probably JHS. So you would want to pay fees and you think it shouldn't have been across the board where... Uh, I, think that, I think that we should have taken it slow. I think that we should have taken it slow. We should have looked first at the public schools that were struggling and looked okay. at the students who are struggling. I am right. all for, for supporting brilliant but needy girls. Right. But there are some brilliant girls who are not needy. I won't cast my eyes there for anything. Okay. Um, but then if you're giving free, free SHS, you're saying that all of them can go into school. But then we, we realize that when you send all of them to school, and let me take Wesley Girls for an example, because I went there. Right. You begin to have the classes um, status in the school because girls whose parents are well-to-do would end up bunching together. Mm. And those whose parents cannot afford the kind of things that the other girls have brought to school will feel left out and will feel... Um, should I say depressed or in some states and um, um, not good for? So, so, for in, so in a nutshell, we should have done this review a long time ago. Yes, but we should have taken our time with free SHS, and I still think that we need we need to really look at it again. Okay, Liz, thank you so much for connecting with us this Tuesday morning, and do Thanks have a me. wonderful day. Liz Hayfriend Asari is a media consultant. And she joined Thank us for our you. news uh, review. Thank you so much. Uh, up next, we have sports. The Invisible Black Star squad is finally out as Otto Ado names a 27-man squad to take up Nigeria as they seek to qualify to the FIFA World Cup for the first time since 2014. Former midfielder Laya Kingston has been speaking. He believes Nigeria are in a better shape than the Black Stars. And also we hear from Chris Hilton and Otto Ado who have all been speaking and calling on Ghanaians to throw their weight behind the senior national team as they seek to lead the country to qualify for its fourth World Cup. We've got this and many more here on the AM Sports with me, Muftar Nabila Abdullah. On Monday, seven players were in camp and started training at the Accra Sports Stadium as Ghana starts its preparations for the World Cup qualifier playoff against the Super Eagles at Abawaya Sports Stadium on March 25. Now, the seven players included standing skipper Thomas Partey. There were also places for Dennis Corsa of Accra House of Oak, as well as Adel Manaf, who are all income. Let's take a look at the full squad put together by the coaches to uh, come up against the Super Eagles as they seek to qualify to the FIFA World Cup. And we have Joseph Wallacott, who is going to be imposed alongside Abdul Manaf Nuruddin, Lawrence Atizike, and there's a return for Richard Ofori, who is also an assistant skipper. 
in the Black Stars. For the defenders, there's Dennis O'Doy. He plays his football for Club Bridge. He qualified to the Premier League with Fulham. And now he's 33 years. He's making his debut to the senior national team. There's Andy Iadam. Gideon Mensah, Dennis Corsa of Accra House of Oak, Montari uh, Kamaheni, uh, he's a former player of Dreams FC, currently with Ashdot FC. There's Daniel Amato of Leicester. Joseph Edu also makes a return after that horrendous mistake against Ethiopia that got him dropped from Black Stars. There's a place for Alexander Jiku, who has been on fire for his club side Strasbourg. There's Abdul Mumin, who plays for Victoria Gumares in Portugal. For the midfielders, it's Idrisu Baba. Edmond Addo, Mohamed Kudus, Elisha Owusu, he's also making his debut to the senior national team. Thomas Fati, who's going to captain the side, and Daniel Kofi Ichre. For wingers, we have Isako uh, Fatao, there's Osman Bukar, who's also making a return to the senior national team for the first time since 2019. There's a place for Joseph Pencil as well, and Yao Yebua also making a return after playing some minutes against South Africa. For strikers, Finally, Felix Afida Jan is under the invitation. He arrived in the country yesterday. There's also a place for Christopher and Chi Ajay, and he made his debut against Saltoma and Principe when Ghana won by one goal to Zero Ketsi with a penalty from Jordan Ayew. Jordan Ayew himself is in there, and uh, he has suffered COVID. It's unclear if he will be available for the first leg on Friday. And also, there's also a place for Kwesi Wright, who plays his football in Germany. These are the 27 men uh, put together by the head coach of the Black Stars, Otto Addo, for the World Cup qualifier against the Super Eagles. Now let's hear from uh, Otto Addo, who has been calling on Ghanaians to throw their weight behind the senior national team. He believes he and the boys are ready to give up their all to secure qualification to Qatar. The Black Stars will host the Super Eagles at the Baba Yara Sports Stadium on March 25 in the first leg of the FIFA 2022 World Cup Qualifiers Playoff. The senior national team is seeking to qualify to the World Cup for the first time since 2014. And Otto Addo, acting head coach of the team, says he and the boys are very confident of scaling the hurdle against the Nigerians. We are only a few days away from playing our crucial match against our rivals, Nigeria. We all expect Ghana to qualify for the FIFA World Cup in Qatar 2022. But that won't be easy, as we need to do our best to make it to this tournament. The players, the technical team and the Ghana Football Association are committed to this task. We really want to make ourselves and the nation proud by qualifying for this upcoming World Cup. Matches between Ghana and Nigeria are always difficult, but we believe in our players, we believe in our strategies, and we believe in the unflinching support of all Ghanaians as we go into these two matches. We are Ghana, and we have what it takes to come out victorious. Technical advisor to the technical team, Chris Hilton, believes this is an opportunity for the three times World Cup participants to make history once again. I would like to urge Ghanaians to remain calm and positive about the team because we strongly believe we have the quality, desire and hunger to achieve the results that we want. It is our aim to qualify for the Qatar World Cup and we all have a duty to make that dream a reality. Ghana have done it before and we can guarantee you that everybody associated with the Black Stars wants this opportunity again to perform on a world stage. This moment presents an opportunity to write history and we are all committed to it from the players, the technical staff, the Ghana Football Association and the government. We value your support. We are Ghana and we are ready. The winner of the tie between Ghana and Nigeria over two legs will secure qualification to participate in the FIFA World Cup to be staged in Qatar later this year. And to Black Stars technical team members, Didi Dramani is an assistant coach. He's also the head of football for Right to Dream Academy. He says they need the unflinching support of Ghanaians if Ghana is to qualify to the FIFA World Cup. 
we are at a very crucial stage in the World Cup qualifiers and this is the time for us to show love and undiluted support to the Blasters. We are heading to the battlefield against an old foe and a familiar opponent in Nigeria and just as we have witnessed over the years these matches are always close and cagey but we believe that the players and the entire nation is ready. It doesn't matter the opposition or where the games take place. What matters is the readiness of the team. With pride and passion, I strongly believe that we are more than capable to win this battle. It is going to be 180 minutes or more of frantic and uncompromising action between two great football nations in Africa. But I believe that the stars will shine and Ghana will conquer. God bless our homeland Ghana and make our nation great and strong. Now let's hear from one man who was on the field in the 2006 African Cup of Nations when Ghana lost to Nigeria. The Super Eagles during the tournament in Egypt, Kessi of a tie tile uh, strike. And in 2008 African Cup of Nations, he was in the midfield, provided a crucial assist as Ghana defeated the Super Eagles to qualify to the semi final of the tournament. That man is Laie Kingston. He says that as we speak, Nigeria appears to be more organized than Ghana, and he's very confident that the, despite this, the Black Stars will come up against the Super Eagles and give off their best. To be honest and fair, for me, I think at the moment, uh, Nigeria is more organized. They are more organized than, than, than Ghana at the moment. We all know that uh, uh, our coach that took us to the last uh, Nations Cup is no more. They're bringing in, before even uh, Milovac came, uh, we, we changed coaches between before before he got to Milovac. So yeah. we, we, there, there's never been consistency in our technical team. You know, at the moment, we know that there is new uh, management uh, uh, coaching staff in now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure that they are now uh, putting their heads together and then trying to uh, find players that will represent Ghana, in, in, especially in that game, that important game, two games for, for, for us. So, so for me, I think it's comparing two teams. I think Nigeria is more prepared, but Ghana, we, 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 we are not prepared yet because we are bringing a new technical team. We have a new technical team. They will come in with different ideology, different style and, and, and all that. So uh, that's where we fall short. But A, like I said earlier on that Ghana-Nigeria game, we don't play those games with. Kingston over there, Ghana Nigeria games. You do not need a team that is on form to be able to beat the other. He is confident the Black Stars, despite poorly organized as we speak, they will give a good account of themselves when they come up against the Super Eagles in 180 minutes of football as they seek to qualify to the FIFA World Cup. Now, let's hear from Johnson Oklo. He's a former youth player. And he's very confident that despite the poor performance of the Black Stars during the African Cup of Nations earlier this year, the team have got what it takes to defeat the Super Eagles and book the ticket to Qatar. Uh, the thing is, mm -hmm. this match Ghana and Nigeria are going to play. I'm sure we Ghana, nobody should team Ghana off. Because I know that Ghana can do something better. And I'm sure we'll do something better. Because I know that Nigeria cannot come and score Ghana here. To Why? my experience, okay. I know our boys, what they can do. If really they mean the match well, Nigeria cannot beat us. I don't know their place, but here, Nigeria cannot beat Ghana. But Nigeria are having very good players, especially at the African. Ghana match. and Nigeria is not about players. It's like Kotokone has. You see Kotokone has recently. Kotokone since Senegal, how many years now? And they have taken Africa Cup. Then. So still, Ghana can do it. We just... Maintain the boys they want to, they will talk to them well. They will understand, they will deliver, they will do it. We know how to play. So why Ghanaians are doing like, because of this Africa, Ghana cannot play football like that. If we do that, we kill the morale of the players. So me, I just want to tell them, I'm begging them. Everybody should just stop cool and pray. Only prayers, we should give them the prayers. Our boys will do it.
If you are a Nigerian and you've settled in Ghana, you have your family in Ghana, and Ghana comes up against Nigeria, which country will you support? Well, uh, my colleague Asara Bidiako paid a visit to the Igbo king, uh, who is domiciled in Ghana, and um, he and his family has been sharing some interesting thoughts on which team to support when the two countries square off on Friday. The super, look, 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 super and the super. ego, sorry, the ego. The players have great skills. Secondly, I just have a strong feeling that, you know, they are going to make us proud. I don't think Nigeria is going to win us because the the um, history is going to pay itself again. Um, Nigeria is never going to beat um, Ghana. Ghana is going to beat them only one goal. We will go to their home, we will play 2 0 against Nigeria. Have you ever seen Star as a black before? This is Green Eagles. The green is the grass, the green uh, represent rep Africa, and the eagles saw a lot, and the eagles carry weight and strength. What are you talking about? And as he said, <laughs> the Eagles, but can they fly above the stars? Uh, 180 football minutes of football will determine which country will qualify to Qatar. But let's do some Ghana Premier League stories where Kumasi Asante Kodoko, they travel to Techiman to come up against Techiman 11 Wonders. The game ended 0 0. But coaches uh, Prosper Nater Ogum and Prince Kofi have got some contrasting opinions on the outcome of the match. According to the head coach of Kumasi Asante Kodoko, they did better and could have won, whilst the head coach of Tachima 11 Wonders also feels that they were better placed to win this tie. Um, we played well, they also played well. Both teams created some decent chances. So I think um, it's okay. What is making you a little more excited? Is it about Kotoko still not having a ball at their net since the start of the second round or picking a point here? Yeah, we all know 11 Wonders to be a very good side, a very difficult venue, a lot of intimidation, a lot of threats and what have you. So, and that pitch, you saw it yourself, not a good pitch. We tried to keep the ball on the turf, it didn't permit us. So in the second half, we, we resorted to a plan B where we had to keep the ball one, two, three, and probably kick the ball behind the defense. So, I mean, they are a very good side, so it's okay. It's a, it's a and quickly, the way forward for Kotoko, you've had a, um, a point here. Moving forward, you play Karela next week. Do you feel it's, that, that is the moment to get our three points and move on on the league lock? Yeah, I, I think um, it's good to have a point here going home. we we'll go and look at what we have to work on and then make sure that we stand firmly and strongly against Karela at home, which we are, we are, we are, we are going to win. Coach, many thanks. Thank you. Kofi, it has ended nil-nil. Do you feel it's a fair result or you feel your side should have gotten all three points? I don't think it's a fair result. We scored a legitimate goal that was disallowed. Uh, we outplayed Kotoko. We, we, we did everything better than Kotoko. You saw it. We pressed, we combined the high pressing with the you know, medium pressing. So it, it forced Kotoko to be kicking the long balls and we were picking it and we were playing. So we, our tactics worked just that we couldn't find the back of the net. Now quickly, you've, you've, your, your last three matches here has ended yeah. in, in a draw. Yeah. Um, you are yet to pick a win. Mm. What does it mean for your side in that relegation battle? No, it just tells us that we need to work more. We need to work on our finishing and all that. And I believe we'll be grinding the results going forward. Child marriage is a criminal offence, punishable by law. But despite the punishment associated with the practice, some families in the Ashanti region hide behind poverty, sociocultural beliefs among others, to push their children into the practice. Girls as young as 10 years, some in junior high schools, are victims of child marriage in the region. Amina, a 16-year-old girl, suffers post-traumatic stress disorder. She struggles with her self-worth as a result of abuse she suffered in the hands of a man who married her when she was just 15 years old. 
The man took her to Côte d'Ivoire two days after she completed her basic education certificate examination. She now came to the school in Ramadan time. She now came to the camp and came to the camp and came to the camp. For Ramana, not her real name, her parents confined her to the room. Upon return from school one day, to marry her father's nephew as a sign of respect. The marriage to reciprocate the financial support Ramana's parents have enjoyed from the 44-year-old Kwame Danso-based electrician means an end to her childhood dream of becoming a journalist. They will tell you that when your parents said, say something, then you say no. Like, uh, it is an insult to them. Even they told me not to come and report. I, I, I told them I am not interested in that marriage. But they, uh, and they told me that if I do not do it, it is an insult. Like Amina, Ramana's parents faced prosecution as every advice from police for them to allow Ramana go back to school after that timely rescue fell on deaf ears. Amina and Ramana were rescued by the police Dofsu with the support of the multimedia group. Superintendent Susanna Derry is the Ashanti Regional Dofsu Commander. With the help of SWAT and the anti arm robbery squad, we were able to get some armed men to accompany me and my investigator to the scene. And we went in forcibly took the girl out without anybody questioning because of the scene they have seen our men around and we rushed her out of the area ramana is encouraging girls who are being forced to become child brides to report to police i want to become a journalist so that i can share my idea like this situation I can, I can use it to tell people that whenever there is any situation, they have to be reported to the police. From Kumasi, for Joy News, I'm in Tewia, reporting. Welcome back on the AM show. Those were some uh, gut-wrenching excerpts of Ohiming Tewia's hotline documentary, Child to Bride. It focuses on girls who are given out for marriage at very young ages. Uh, we're going to engage our guests now on this all-important matter. It is still going on in 21st century Ghana. Superintendent Susan Derry is Dofsu commander in the Ashanti region. Uh, we also have Dr. Ruth Owusu, MP, President Psychiatrists Association of Ghana. They both join uh, the conversation. Uh, Doc and Supo, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us here. Good morning and thank you for having me. Right, so I've only heard one response. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing. So, so who, whose voice is it that I'm hearing? I'm not sure, but this is uh, Ruth also and she's speaking. Right, Ruth, thank you so much for connecting. Uh, Supo, uh, you would have to unmute so we can hear you as well. Superintendent Derry, if, if you can hear me, please yes. press the unmute button so yes. we can. So good morning and good morning to all your cherished viewers. Great, great. I'm Superintendent Susanna. Right. It's, it's of a Right. Pleasure, pleasure to have you. Uh, Superintendent, I, I'd just like to start with you in terms of 
the dynamics. The Ashanti region, interestingly, has become a hotbed for some of these activities. And uh, girls as little as 10 sometimes are, you know, roped into all kinds of things for different reasons. But uh, why do you think the prevalence is getting higher and higher in the Ashanti region? Uh, do you know what is accounting for this? Well, it is a cultural practice that is uh, practiced among some sections of the region. Okay. And especially within, excuse me to say, our Zongo communities mm. within the Kumase metropolis and other areas in the Ashanti region. And so because it's a cultural practice and a religious practice, they think there's nothing wrong with it. And so they are practicing their culture, they are practicing their religion. And so when they are doing it, it appears uh, they, they, they don't see anything wrong with it. And so they hide it and do it, but now people are getting enlightened and so we get to pause and then that makes it look like it's on the rise, but it has been happening under cover. So it, it is not that the prevalence is rising. It is merely that because people are becoming more aware of the situation, exactly. more cases are exactly. coming up, and that is why we see a sort of uptick in the numbers. Exactly. The school children, especially who are always victims, are being more educated by their school uh, teachers. Then sometimes dogs who and other interested uh, stakeholders also go around to sensitize them. And so they are getting more aware. And so whenever there is this thing confronting them, some are able to sneak to inform us. And then the teachers to get our contacts and then they inform us. And so we go to work. And that makes it look like it's on the rise. But actually, it is something that has practiced, that has been practiced for a long, long, long time. Right. And now it's coming out, yeah. And, and so it traces its roots into so many other factors. Well, we're getting into some of the factors later, but I want to find out, I mean, into the northern belt of our country, and, and in fact, our border areas, a lot of uh, such activities happen. But what exactly is the prevalence rate? In other words, you're saying that it's not necessarily shooting up, but it is that people are becoming more aware. But what exactly are the numbers in the Ashanti region? Uh, when it comes to child marriages or the cases that pass through uh, your unit? Yes, as for the numbers, it, it, it depends on the, the, you see, usually you only get the tip off and you move. It's not like people coming every day, like in cases of other crimes like assault, uh, maybe in causing damage where you have it every day being reported. As for child marriage, we depend on tip-offs. And then sometimes we go around nosing around when we get uh, any information that such a thing is yet to happen. So for the numbers, they are not too many, but they, 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 they come out as time goes on. Uh, the period between 2019 and now, I, I would say we've investigated not less than about 15 to 20 cases of child marriage. There are some we have successfully prosecuted. There are some too that are still uh, being investigated. And then some we have been able to educate them and then stop them from continuing their practice. Right. So 15 to about 20. We know that in, in, in the, I mean, it varies greatly in the northern belt of the country, in the northern regions, it can hit as high as 39%. And even here in the Great Accra region as well, it's extant with about 12% of those occurring uh, here. But let me come to uh, Dr. Ruth Owusu Enki, and especially as your president of the Psychiatrist Association of Ghana. Let's start from the end of how, just how traumatic it can be for a young person. And we know the legal age in this country, 18 for a boy or a girl to get married. But in some instances, at 16, with the consent of parents, some girls, for example, uh, get married. But, but how, just how traumatic can this be for children to be thrust into adulthood so quickly, and especially without their permission? 
yes, this is really a, a traumatic for children. In fact, child marriage is categorized um, under child abuse in general. Um, if you force a child who is not even physically fully developed, mentally, emotionally developed into marriage, it is certainly an abuse on the part of the child. Uh, most of these children have developed depression, they have developed anxiety disorders. Some go through what we call post-traumatic stress disorder because of the trauma of having to face a, a, a situation or a marriage that they are not prepared for. And some lose their self-esteem, they begin to feel that their dreams of becoming a, a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, a police officer, somebody significant in the society is all shattered because they, they have to go through marriage at a very, at a very tender age. Um, and so the mental health implication of child marriages uh, cannot be overemphasized. They are negative on these children and on the society as a whole. Imagine this kind of mother going through all of these um, emotional, psychological uh, uh, trauma, having to give birth and take care of children. You can imagine that these children would not get the proper upbringing. And so the effect even trickles down on the children that are likely to come out of such marriages. Now we have some of these children getting married to men even three times uh, their, their age. And, and, and that in itself complicates the situation. You've spoken about the bodies of these children, but what do you see to be some of the factors and, and uh, are you seeing them addressed? What are some of the factors that are causing uh, these child marriages from where you sit? Um, like the superintendent, superintendent said earlier, sometimes it's because of the culture. Um, I've had um, people come to our clinic who have been forced into these marriages as a way of showing appreciation to this elderly man who helped the family go through school and, and stuff like that. And um, it's either it's culture or it's a way of showing appreciation. So we give up, uh, we give you our daughter whom you helped through school, or we give you our daughter in exchange of the immense help you gave to the family. And um, that is absolutely wrong. You don't um, exchange the entire being, the entire uh, uh, um, human being, the entire wellness of someone uh, in exchange of an appreciation. That is totally wrong. And those who are doing it as, as a result of cultural, uh, um, um, their culture, that culture is outmoded. Um, in the 21st century, some of these things should not continue to go on. Um, as far back as 2014, um, about 21% 20, of child marriages were still going on in the country. Um, I'm not sure of the current statistic, but this is shameful. Um, there are enough adults out there. Why don't you go for them than to go for these innocent, innocent children or innocent girls whose dreams are entirely shattered um, because of being forced into this marriage. In any way, they may not become um, any proper, in quotes, um, partners or spouses because the whole ordeal or the whole arrangement is very traumatizing. So you will not get the best out of the marriage anyway. And so why do you even go for it? And you talk about the cultural elements which are stark. Uh, we see them, but there are also economic factors, aren't there? Exactly. And the, the economic factors will be a subset of the um, exchange for an exchange for a good, um, a, a good thing that a rich man or an elderly rich family did for another, another uh, poor family. And so, yes, these all boils down, um, some of these things boil down to economic challenges and economic uh, difficulties. But then again, uh, no reason is, is, is good enough for any girl to be pushed into child marriage. Uh, uh, Doc, before I go back to Supo with, with uh, just another question, I, I'd like to ask you, looking broadly at our society, what do you think the impact is not just on the girls uh, who are forced into uh, to become child brides, but society as a whole, their families, their communities, what do you see to be the ripple effect of these actions? 
Yes, I, I already mentioned the ripple effect that starts from even the children that may be born out of such marriages. Um, one, this is a mother who would not be in the right frame of mind to take care of her offsprings the right way. And these children go into the society, they, they are being brought up or raised by a mother who is depressed. These children will eventually end up with uh, substance abuse, adjustment disorders, um, conduct disorders. They, could, they cannot fit into the society because they would have um, um, mental health and behavioral challenges or sometimes personality disorders that people may not know that stems, stems out from the kind of home that they are coming from. And so at, at the end of the day, uh, these are children who are in the classroom or are in the society with, with similarly other children who have been brought up well, and they would be negative influence on, on, on the other children. They cannot fit into the society. They end up um, in one social vice or the other. Um, they grow up, they are working, they can't fit into the society, they can't fit into any job, there are problems for their employers. And so in the long term, medium term, uh, uh, and even in the, in the short term, there are several stages of mental health implications. Unfortunately, most of these are never brought to the attention of experts. We, we for instance, at CAT run an abuse clinic and of all the cases of abuse or, or survivors of abuse who come to our clinic, since 2019, we started the clinic, we have not had any case of, of um, a child marriage being brought there. We have seen several cases of sexual abuse, emotional abuse, but nobody has brought a child or a girl who has been forced into marriage. And I think that they end at the level of the of the of the society or of the community. Once they're able to bring the child out, it ends there. But if we're able to bring such children out and get psychological and psychiatric help for them, they may turn around to be useful people in the society. It's all downsides to uh, this act, this horrible act. But let me come to Supo on, on my very next bit. I know that in 2014, there was an ending child marriage unit that was set up by the, minister, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social uh, Protection. And I also know that in the year following that, 2015, a high level uh, national advisory committee was set up to you know, put together some of these matters moving forward in collaboration with UNICEF. Do you have any idea what has emanated from the work from 2014 and 2015 and what its impact has been as of now? Uh, I, I, are you with me, uh, Supo? Do we, do we still have Supo on the line? Yes, hello. Yes, uh, did you get my question or should I repeat it? Yeah, could you repeat the question? So I was saying that in 2014, I know there was an ending child marriage unit that was set up. Uh, it was under the Ministry of uh, Gender, Children and Social Protection. In the year following 2015, there was a high level advisory committee that was also set up to aid in its work in conjunction with UNICEF. My question is, do you know what work has flowed from there? I mean, what have been some of the gains, if you know about this unit, since 2014, 2015 till now uh, that, that have been you know, brought to bear? You see, DOCSU is a police unit. Right. And we work strictly under our mandate. We know child marriage is a, a crime. And so when it is reported, we take it as it is, concentrate on the investigation of our cases and possibly prosecute it, or where we need to advise parties to desist from it, we do. So if other institutions are also uh, they be putting things in place, it will be difficult for me to be able to trace, to know what exactly has happened and probably whether it has got any impact or not. But since we are solely police officers, we work, we work strictly under our mandate. And so for that aspect, I don't think I'll be able to tell. But what I know is that we do a lot of sensitization. Sometimes in collaboration with these uh, institutions and uh, organizations, 
For instance, years ago, we had that collaboration with UNICEF and then um, other uh, NGOs that are interested in such issues. And we went around sometimes schools, churches, and then sometimes uh, on air to educate the public on a child marriage and things that are not supposed to be done to children. And so for that aspect of your question, I think it will be a bit difficult for me to. So, so I was just asking that about collaborative work, uh, knowing that Dobsu also collaborates with these other institutions of uh, state. But uh, so moving forward, and, and I just want to put out this data as we move forward and share thoughts on how to eradicate this. I mean, we did it with uh, female genital mutilation, even bearing a different name initially, uh, uh, circumcision, female circumcision. We, we criminalized it. We made it even more difficult for people to do. And we've made many gains. What is the way forward? But before you come in, uh, Supo, I just wanted to put this data out there for all of us to appreciate. Every 40 seconds or so, about 20 girls under the age of 18 across the world get uh, married. Now, each year, 12 million girls are married before the age of 18. That is 23 girls every minute and nearly one in every two seconds. That is a stark reality and that is something we all have to grapple with. And in Ghana, we are making our contribution as well for the negative. So, Supo, starting with you, what is the way forward? What more can we do? Yes, the way forward, we need to educate and educate and educate. You see, this whole thing is a little of culture and a little of religion. You see, poverty is there, but um, that the group of people who practice this, they are not the only people who are poor. And so if everybody says, because I'm poor, I have to practice this, I don't think that should be the way. But there are other factors. This issue of culture and religion. Because, in fact, sometimes when we even arrest some of the uh, offenders and we are people speaking, some of them will tell us that. Uh, that is how we, we, we do things. When the girl starts getting dressed, then it means she's right for marriage. And so whether she goes to school or not, she will end up marrying. So why don't you do it now? And others too are even referring us to how, excuse me to say, uh, Prophet Muhammad had so many uh, wives. And even the youngest, they will mention as low as nine year old uh, girl was Prophet Muhammad's wife. So their religion allows it. And so when it is like this, we need to let them understand that, no, those days, Prophet Muhammad, now we are in Ghana and our laws are saying this, so it is not allowed. And excuse me to say, most of them too are foreigners who have come to settle. And they will tell us that back in their country, we practice it. Then we also tell them that once you are in Ghana, you must do what Ghana says. Mm. So you see, we need to educate them, let them know. In fact, with the few arrests and the prosecutions we made, now it's like it's opening people's eyes. Some of them, even some sneak, some will see from outside, just walk to us and say, watch this particular house. Something is going to happen there. So when they tell us this, then we set our men around and they nose around until we catch them. And in fact, when we catch them, there are some who succeed in stopping them from pursuing their aim. But there are some who are always so stubborn that no matter what, they insist that they must just do what they want. And when it comes to that, then we must move to the next level. So it is education, education. We need to educate them. They need right. to understand. All right. Uh, Dr. Ruth Ousu-Entry, you have the final bite. What is the way forward in, in less than a minute, if you can?
Yes, thank you. So education is the way to go. Right. Um, and beyond the education, those who are already survivors of child marriage should get should not just be moved out of the marriage, but subsequently be given psychosocial support. When these girls are empowered, they themselves become advocates against the act. There okay. will be people with, with lived experiences who will be able to become um, strong advocates against the act. I'm encouraging uh, uh, Super to bring this child over to the abuse clinic at Kompanochi Teaching Hospital for her to get some support as well. Thank you so much, uh, uh, ladies, for joining the conversation. Dr. Ruth Ousu, MP, President, Psychiatrist Association of uh, Ghana. We also have Superintendent Susan Derry, uh, DOFSU commander in the Ashanti uh, region. Child a Bride. That's our latest hotline documentary. Don't you uh, fail to catch it right here on this network.